right. Welcome. Thank you for coming uh, to another installment of Rare Music. Uh, my name's Aaron Wellborn. I'm the Director of Communications for the Libraries. And we're really glad you're here. We have another great program for you this evening. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say a few quick thank yous to our sponsors. Uh, so this series, which is in its fifth year, is a partnership between the Duke University Musical Instrument Collections and the libraries. And it's made possible with additional support from the Vice Provost for the Arts, the Carabina Endowment, Friends of Dumic, High Strung Violins and Guitars, uh, Ruggiero Piano, and Vocor Incorporated. So if you enjoy our programs, and we really hope you do, let our sponsors know how much you appreciate it because they make it all possible. So thank you. Also, uh, as a reminder, if you have a phone or electronic <laughs> device or a computer or something that's going to make noise, now would be a good time to turn that off. Um, and so I'm going to hand things over now to Brenda Scott. She's the curator for the musical instrument collections, and she'll introduce our guests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin, and it's just always such a pleasure to work, to work with the libraries on projects, and we're very excited about this season. I don't know where everybody is today, but I'm glad that you all are here, and so we're going to have a, a nice, intimate time, and if any of you in the back would like to move forward to see better, now is a good time to do that. Um, I just wanted to remind you that our next program is not actually November. Normally, we have once a month, and... Uh, this time we're having two in October, and another unusual thing about it is that it's on Monday, and it's this coming Monday, and it's also not here. It's in Biddle Music Building in the lower lobby, and it's not at four. It's at noon, so it's a completely different schedule. So I don't want any of you to turn up here four o'clock on Monday. Monday, don't do that. We won't be here. Uh, so it's Monday at noon in the lower lobby of Biddle, and it's a program on Carnatic music by our visiting scholar from India. So I hope that you can come to that. And at this time, I'm, I just want to say how excited I am to have um, folks from High Strung Violins and Guitars here. I have been working with um, High Strung since, uh, I guess since they opened on Ninth Street way back. And now they're on Broad Street and they are one of our sponsors and they help look after instruments. So I highly encourage you to go to them um, with your questions and your business and you have questions today. And at this point, I would, I'm very excited to introduce Lee Raymond and Bud Godreau. Thank you very much for being here. I am Lee, and this is Bud. I'm Bud. Uh, I want to tell you, well, first of all, thanks very much to Brenda and to all of you for having us here. Um, we have been in partnership with Brenda for several years now, most recently going over to repair some sort of bellows instrument, which was a little bit outside of our expertise, but we managed to get it working, and we're very proud of ourselves. We were. I think it took about uh, three visits before we finally figured it out. Um, I am one of the owners of High Strung in its current incarnation. High Strung itself is a shop that has been around for probably almost 20 years and started on Perry Street where the Ninth Street Dance mm -hmm. Studio now is. It started as a very small shop, uh, working primarily with guitars, both building and repairing them, not too much retail. And it's gone through several owners and different incarnations as ownership has changed. Um, Bud certainly predates me at High Strung. Bud is the senior luthier at High Strung. Uh, and you've been working on violence for... About 35 for, years. 35 years, so yes, um, hence the senior. I, my training, specifically formal training, is with threaded instruments. I have had some training at the University of New Hampshire and I'm kind of apprenticed to Bud right now because he's got some notion of wanting to retire someday. I'm not sure we're ever really going to let that happen. <laughs> no, you can't go. They won't let me. Um, so there, there is a bit of a difference in outlook between repairing fretted instruments and repairing bowed instruments, um, but the essentials are the same. And what we want to talk about today specifically is the care and repair of instruments rather than building. The reason being, and Bud can address this more in just a moment, there is a very different approach, I'd say almost a different mindset between the two. 
I was drawn to repair when I hit that wonderful midlife crisis at about age 40 and had to get out of the business world and start working with my hands and had, uh, I've got some ability in woodworking and I wanted to fix things, I wanted to heal things, I wanted to diagnose what was going on with this and that. It was either this or, you know, veterinary school. And I already played instruments, it made a lot more sense to do this. Um, and for me, a big part of the challenge and the thrill of the chase when an instrument comes in is that time that you do spend before you really open it up, when you're playing it, when you're figuring out what's wrong with it, and you're deciding what your approach will be. And I think that differs quite a bit from when you want to build, and you have mm -hmm. built several violins, so would you like to address the, the thrill of the, the build as well? Well, um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I graduated University of Florida in 1957. I was a rocket engineer at Cape Canaveral out on the West Coast and so forth. But I always, I started playing the violin when I was 12 years old and I had a real passion for the violin. And I remember seeing in a book, How to Build a Violin. And it was in a magazine. And they stopped running the ad and I thought, how am I ever gonna get this done? <laughs> Midlife crisis, four years old. I walked in to have my bow rehaired to a gentleman. I saw violins all over. Where did you get all these violins? He said, I've made them. How many? He made about 40 violins. His name was Andrew Stavnetsky. He said, well, I'd like you to take me on as a student. So it, it took a long time for me to convince him. But eventually, he took me as a student. And so we worked in building and repairing. And I started repairing for some of the local music shops. And then I went to the University of New Hampshire and studied with Hans Nebel. He's one of the most famous restorers in the world. If you have a Stradivarius violin, you seek out Hans Nebel or someone like him. And I had a wonderful time uh, learning repair with him. And I always remember he said, he started, uh, he was German, uh, learning to, to build violins in Germany. But he says that then he became a repair person, or restore. We, we like to use the word restoration rather than repair. And he says it is more difficult to be a <coughs> restorer than a maker. Because as Lee said, um, there are set procedures when you're building. I'm not saying it's easy, but there are more set procedures. When you repair, every, every repair is a challenge. How do you go about uh, addressing what the issues are with the instrument? Uh, how, what steps do you take? If you try one repair first, maybe you can't do the second. Uh, do you replace the block first? What do you do? So you have to think logically uh, how you're going to go about making the restoration, the repair. So that's the difference. And I think it, my engineering training was very helpful. I designed uh, um, uh, uh, facilities for rocket engine tests and uh, launches in, in California. So it, the same procedure of logically looking at a problem, breaking it down to its fundamentals. And what I found very, very helpful is having an engineering background. The instrument, uh, what, can I have a minute? Sure. Yes. The instrument uh, encompasses three things. It's an art form. It's beautiful. It has grace has balance, the violin is a beautiful piece. To work on one, you need uh, skills with knives, so you need craft skills. And then the third thing is to understand how the forces are at work, and this, it's a mechanical piece. It obeys the laws of physics. To understand the laws of physics, do we have any physicists here? To understand, okay. You understand the laws of physics and mechanics, and when you're making a repair, understand how uh, that affects the addition, how it works. And I can talk about that a little bit more, how it produces a tone. But that's how I got into the business. I retired, uh, I worked for 35 years part-time uh, for music stores, doing restoration, and built a few violins. And then when I retired, I'm 75 years old, going to be 76 in about three weeks. When I retired, I decided that I was going to continue doing this part-time, and I hooked up with, with, uh, with uh, 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 High Strung Music. 
and they won't let me retire. <laughs> but I have cut back a little bit. To me, it's I don't have an interest in violence. I have a passion. It's an absolute passion with me. I probably worked on and held in my hands somewhere between 25 and 30,000 violins in 35 years. And I never wavered in my passion for the instrument, and cellos and basses also. And the same for me with, with all of the fretted instruments, the guitars and the mandolins that come through. One of the things that we want to start talking about is the difference between repair and restoration, and also the difference between repairs, things that look like were repairs on older instruments, but it actually were alterations that were done because of changes in the playing style. And unfortunately, I, I looked around the shop, we don't have any instruments that I can pass around that have neck grafts. But some of the things that we think of as repairs really came about because, for example, the A changed from, what did it used to be? Somebody here probably knows, 438 to 440? 415. 415, okay, a significant change, which necessitated a change in the existing instrument. And you've, have you done net grants yourself? Or just looked at lots no, of instruments that no. have them? No. Um, are, are they in the book? No, well, if you have pictures? a good eye, you can like, see them on some of yeah. the pictures. Um, but Doug can tell you a little bit about what, what that means and why today we think of it as a repair, and it's not something you would necessarily do to an instrument, but at the time it was quite necessary. So take it away. Yeah. Before 1800, when uh, Stradivarius and Guarnerius and all the great Cremona makers made violins, the original violins had necks that were straight. You see there's a tilt, a slight mm -hmm. tilt. The necks were straight. To get the bridge up high, the fingerboard tapered from thin to thicker up. Now when they changed from around 1800 from um, 415 to 440C and they wanted violins, concert halls were getting larger so they wanted violins that would project more and the person who really developed more powerful violins was Antonio Stradivarius. Before that uh, he learned from the Amati family and they made smaller violins with high arching which is very strong Think of the uh, Roman arch. Roman arch is very, very strong. Uh, so when the, the high arching with the Roman arch, the tops tended to be, to be stiffer. So the violins, although um, are very sweet sounding, don't have power of projection. So Stradivarius lowered the top, made flatter plates so that the, the plates could vibrate more and project more. So around 1800, when they had larger concert halls, they um, wanted to change the 440, uh, change the A to 440, longer string length, more force on the top, so they had to do two things. They had to take the necks, which were shorter, to make them longer, since these were very, the world's best violins at the time, uh, instead of taking the neck off and putting an entire new neck on, they would do what we call a neck graft. That is, they would make a cut, take off the scroll of the master, make a new neck longer with a tilt on it, and then graft the scroll back on. So any genuine pre-1800, roughly, violin, uh, uh, of, especially from the masters, will have a neck graft. And that's one of the things you look for. And there are fake neck grafts where they Somebody is making a copy and they scribe little lines to make it look like a neck graph. But you look and you see the grain going across that and you can tell it's, it's not the real thing. So that put more pressure on the top to get more power out of the violin. And so they modified the inside. See that bar? That is under the base side of the, the, uh, the bridge. So they had to make deep, deeper uh, base bars. So the end result was violins with more power, more projection to fill larger concert halls. But all of these, I don't know about all, but some have not been, but most of the Guarneri's and the Stradivarius and those made in Cremona before 1800 have neck wraps. Um. 
another thing that we saw a very distinct modification of is the shape of the, of the bow. And we have all of these things on the table. Once we're through with our little presentation, we want to invite everybody up to experiment with some of the things that we brought. We have a glue pot. We have a couple of instruments. I popped <laughs> open some seams on one of them. So if you want to, under supervision, play with the spool clamps and the glue, we can let you do that. Uh, we've got one instrument that we have a, a top crack in, and I want to show you basically, well, I forgot to bring the cleats, but three different ways of, of repairing cracks in the top of an instrument. I'm more used to guitars, where they're totally flat. I looked around last night. I had no no guitars with splits in the top. It was almost disappointing. Um, I did have one customer's instrument, but I didn't feel quite right bringing a customer instrument outside the shop. Uh, but there are, there are ways of that they've been repaired in the past that I'll talk about that have changed. But the bow has gone from, and you probably, who here plays a bowed instrument? Okay, and, and who here plays fretted instruments? Okay, excellent. The bow, for those of you who have never seen it before, <coughs> well, this style, started it looked very much like the archery bow sure with the top that curved this way. And as I'm sure you all know, at some point, got modified into this bow. Um, these can both be, Bud has already worked on this one so that we'll be able to pull it apart. But at some point, and I'm not a historian, so I can't tell you when, at some point, all of it changed. And it became a lot more difficult to rehair. This one, when you come up and take a look at it, you'll see it's a hank of horsehair that's been tied at both ends, put through a couple of holes. It's run across this part so that you could hold it. But the hair itself is just held in with a couple of wooden plugs. And when we get this one disassembled, I think there's eight, nine, ten different parts to it. If you count all the wedges. If you count all the wedges, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So it's, it's become far more challenging, some of these things. But again, I wouldn't say that it's, it's a repair so much as a modification to move from one style of bow to another. And uh, the other thing that we wanted to talk about being different is repair versus restoration. Our shop is not a shop that specializes in restoration. That is something, I think, that is reserved for the very fine instruments. Either they're from a top maker or they have so much family meaning that they want it restored to exactly how it appeared. And we do get instruments in now and then where we're in a bit of a quandary. And I can talk about a couple of guitars I've seen where, well, I see the thing that comes to mind right now is I have a beautiful baritone ukulele that somebody has been bringing to me for two years now in an effort to make it playable. And it's a pretty old ukulele. The problem is it's tuners. We, we dealt with all of the open seams and the cracks and it's structurally sound, sound, but the tuners are the original tuners and they simply don't work. And we've been back and forth and back and forth on at what point do you just say, we're going to leave it as is and keep it at its economic value with the original tuners, and at what point do you say, no, darn it, I want to make it playable, and plug in the holes and redrill and put in a whole different kind of tuner that didn't exist when this thing was made. We are still negotiating on this one. Um, and I don't know quite what to advise him. I could, I could go either direction. And Bud, I know, has seen many, many violins that have come in. They're, they've been in the attic for years, and they belong to great-great-grandpa. Mm -hmm. That's a different question. Yeah, that's a different question. When people walk into the store, and I see they have an old violin, the first question I ask them, is this an heirloom, or did you buy this at a pawn shop, or did someone give it to you? And they, if they tell me it's grandpa's violin, so there's two values to this violin. One is what I call the street value. When I restore it, and it may cost $100 to $200 to restore it, uh, the street value may not be much more than $150. It's not worth putting the money into. But if it's grandpa's, grandma's, or your aunt's, or some beloved family member's violin, so it, it is Priceless. There is no price you can put on this because it cannot be replaced. It is a one of a kind. Therefore, emotionally, it has a lot of attachment to you, and it is worth putting the money into a restore it. Now, restoration, as Lee uh, alluded to, you can go back to making it appear as it was new, strip the varnish 
I don't do that. I restore it to the best it was when Grandpa was playing it, Grandma was playing it. Bring it back to its best playing condition with all the patina, with all the, the scratches, with the, the sweat marks, whatever that's on it, because I believe the, the soul of that person is in that violin. They played it, loved it for so long, and I wouldn't remove that. So I bring it back to the point where it's playable, they can enjoy it. So it's irreplaceable and it it's, uh, has no value. I mean, it has a value. <laughs> I mean, it is priceless. Mm -hmm. it, does, it has a wonderful value. And that's, and then I ask them to make it a decision. I say, this violin would be $200 to repair. It's not worth 150 or it may be worth $1,000 or more. So that's the issue that I address when people bring an instrument in to me the value to them, the street value, and the sound. Often I don't know how it's going to sound when it's just all apart. Mm -hmm. I can make a guesstimate. I look at the uh, graduations, how fixed the tops are. Um, I can get some sense of the quality. Is it a cheap uh, factory-made instrument? Might not be a good... Uh, and that's another whole argument <laughs> about um, uh, factory-made. What factory-made means? Today, factory made means it's in a big factory with big machines and chomp, 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 and they grind these things out. Years ago, factories in Europe, in Germany, in France, and England, for that matter, factories were the whole towns made, made violins. So they had craftsmen. One family would be making tops, one family making bottoms, somebody bending sides, somebody putting them together. And a lot of these violins have very, very good tone. So factory made 150 years ago is an entirely different thing from what we mean when we talk about factory made uh, violins today. So that brings us up to actual repairs that we see most often. And I think for any, any wooden instrument, the kinds of issues that we see are the same over and over and over. And if you look at the instruments that are in co collections at the Smithsonian or the Library of Congress, for that matter, where you have the beautiful old, you know, or has anyone ever been to the collection out in Vermilion in South Dakota? That, oh my gosh, if you like old instruments, you have to go to the University of South Dakota to Vermilion and spend several days going through their shrine and music. It's a huge, huge museum. And uh, the Strad room takes up the first floor. Um, well worth it. But what you see in the old instruments is the same thing that we see walking through the door with an instrument that was made last year or two years ago. The enemies of these instruments, be they violins or, or guitars or mandolins or even a sitar that I worked on was heat, lack of humidity, and carelessness. And I think of all of those, the lack of humidity is probably the worst. Mm -hmm. The variance that we have, especially in this climate, between it's really incredibly humid, oh no, now my lips are chapped. What we're feeling, the instruments are feeling, and when you have instruments that are made of several different kinds of wood, which most of them are, swelling and shrinking at different rates, you're going to get cracks coming in. In guitars, it's usually on the top, somewhere near the middle. On the violins, it's very often down at the saddle, which is ebony, and is shrinking and swelling at a very different rate from the spruce that it is glued to. So you get cracks that come right up here and right up here, and we see them today just as we saw them hundreds of years ago. For violins, I don't think the technique of repair has necessarily changed all that much. I think for guitars it has to some extent and a lot of it just comes into the fact that materials <coughs> have pretty much stayed the same in the building, but the tools that we have to use in our professions have certainly changed quite a bit. And it's just sheer ingenuity on somebody's part. I needed something that could reach in there and stab this and pull it out and then turn around and stick it back in. Somebody around, you know, who knows when, had to come up with that. And we end up with things like it. This kind of soundpost set, which you're welcome to take a look at, versus this kind, you know, where you can reach in and grab it. Um, one of the big breakthroughs for me in repairing instruments, especially cracks that have been left open for a long time, 
you know, oh yeah, it's been growing for two or three years, I need it by Saturday. <laughs> and by now, and that does happen, uh, so by now there's been a lot of shrinking and swelling and the two sides of this crack are, are like this. They don't want to necessarily come together easily. If I can't get my hand in there to be able to push it, very often I can get magnets in on a long pole. And there are some incredible rare earth, I brought some for you guys to play with, but you have to be careful because the very first time I used them, I pulled them out of the packaging that they've been shipped in and they slammed together and one of them actually split. They are that powerful. But it's powerful enough that if you're careful, they can bring those edges back together with such force and yet not do any damage to the instrument. Well, I don't think those existed 100 years ago. I don't think so. I don't think anyone was using them. So cracks are common. Open seams are very common. And is that from glue drying out, do you think? Well, or um, sometimes it's from a knock. Yeah, it's very, very common. So it's from a shrinkage. But also, the violin is made so that the back is not to be removed. So you use a very heavy glue, so it's mm -hmm. very firmly attached. But you use a very light glue on the top, so that should you have to make some kind of repair and get to the inside, you can get an opener in, like opening a clam, very mm -hmm. easily without damaging the wood of the top. So it's made to come apart the top. Um, seams that tend to come loose because the glue is so light on the top you're going to see this top seam coming loose every once in a while that's normal often it's right where your hand is your hand has sweat moisture so it softens the glue there and the other place is under the neck so when I look at violin I look there first <laughs> I look there second then I look at the other places other times where the seam can, can come loose is due to the shrinkage we were talking about. The top wood shrinks across the grain, not along the grain. So the top wants to shrink this way, and the back wants to shrink that way. As it does, it's pushing on that side, and it pops loose, and before very long, the sides can, if the violin is old enough and saw enough drying, kind of overhang out beyond the edge. So you can't glue it back. There's nothing to hold uh, the side to the top. So you have to do what I call slipping the sides. You take it loose around. You uh, take the uh, saddle off, get in the block of wood in here, get inside the block of wood and loosen the side from that block. Loosen it back. Pull it in to where it should be. Now they're going to overlap and you very carefully file down those two edges so that you're bringing the side in and now it fits again. Gluing it back to the block. Back, I call it, that's called slipping the sides. That's where these clamps come in. <coughs> these are spool clamps. In fact, I'll just pass a couple around and take a look. Um, these are carefully machined and purchased but most people just made their own for years. I know you've got a bunch that you made. I'm not sure there were, there were variations on the theme. If you look at pictures of the tools, though, that some of the builders were using, especially violin builders, three or four hundred years ago, almost everything was made out of wood. So even the screws would have been made out of wood because metal was just hard to come by and very expensive. And we're, we are lucky that nowadays, you know, it's a lot easier to get your hands on these things. Um, I was laughing at myself, though. I think one of the reasons I don't want you to retire is that your description of this, what Bud did not mention is that you have to be pushing at the same time that you're gluing and at the same time that you're clamping. And very often, it's a two-person job. One of us is pushing, and the other one is screwing on the clamps. And when he wasn't in last week, I had to yell for the bookkeeper to come and help me because I'm not doing <laughs> the glue job. I was like, get over here. I need your help with the glue job. And there was this audible pause, and she said, you what? <laughs> but she did beautifully. So she, she just was able to tighten those things down as I was pushing. Um, Luthier should be born with four arms. Oh, at least. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so backs and open seams are very common. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other things. Well, uh, 
with guitars, you have some other issues that come about because they're larger, and the strings, you have six strings instead of four, and they are steel core all the way, and so there are tremendous tensions put on between the bridge and where they're crossing over the nut to the peg head. And one of the most common problems that we see that unfortunately I don't even have time to work on in the shop, it's such a major repair, is gradually over time, if this is the bridge and this is the head of the guitar, there's so much tension from here to here that it starts to pull everything up. And so where the neck is now joined at the body, you've, you've got this dip because it, and, and the strings are just impossibly high. This can be prevented with careful humidification, with loosening strings when instruments are not being played. But unfortunately, nobody ever tells guitar players this when they get their first guitar, or even necessarily their second guitar. And heaven help them if they get it through the internet, they get no guidance at all. <laughs> so we see a lot of instruments, and it's, it saddens me when I have to say, this is a $300 job and your guitar is worth 150 Mm -hmm. And that's where you have to tread so carefully, as Bud does with the violins, and say, is this a family instrument? It's, mm -hmm. is, this, is this going to be worth the 300 that you want to put into it? Or are you so in love with the sound that it's worth it? Uh, but that is another major job where you're having to pull a fret out, drill uh, right at the neck, and drill a hole in down through the block where it joins, put in a needle and some steam, and steam the whole thing loose because it's also glued to a block. But in guitars, in, instead of using a hide glue, and we've got hide glue for people like the um, we use wood glue, because we don't want these things coming undone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's harder to get it apart. Um, but you know, and then once you do, you've got to set it to the right angle to get it back, and are you shimming it, or are you shaving it, and you, you know, there's a lot of measuring that it goes on. Um, one of the things that we try to do in our repairs that we've touched on is Never do what you can't undo. <laughs> and this comes to mind particularly with this. This is a bow that Brenda brought to us that was made by a gentleman in Arizona, was it? Arizona. From the collection. And we will be doing a proper rehair on it. Um, but as I st started to work with it to get the little bits of hair that were left off, I discovered that the gentleman had used Gorilla Glue. <laughs> no. and gorilla Glue, you know, high glue no. you can get off with a little water a and little some water. patience. Mm -hmm. Wood glue you can get off with the application of gentle heat. I usually like a light bulb from a lamp over if I'm replacing a nut on a guitar. That's my heat source. I don't want anything too hot. But a light bulb, eh, it's enough for me to be able to work it clear. Gorilla glue doesn't respond to much of anything except brute force and some acetone. Um, so I was dripping it from a paintbrush into the little hole last night, and even then I lost all the wedges. It just kind of said, I give up, and disintegrated on me. But wedges we can make. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about that I skipped over is adjustments versus repairs. People come in, and we will charge them. If you, if you ever, have ever brought an instrument to us for a setup, or your sound post needed to be adjusted, you'll see on your receipt that it says repair. It's not really a repair. It's a moving of things around. But on a good instrument, minor adjustments make a huge difference. And we brought an instrument that I think will respond well to this. This is an experiment. We did not get a chance to practice this. Um, this is just a standard violin, uh, strung up with dominance, for those who need to know. And I believe its sound post is where it's supposed to be right now. Yeah, I need my tool, measuring tool. Yes, this is, I'll let you explain your measuring tool. This is my measuring tool. Here, okay, we'll pass the other one around. <laughs> we don't get these it's a piece of cardboard. Now. <laughs> I can determine where the sound post is, merely by inserting it. That tells me it's that far behind the foot. In fact, it's not in the right spot. Well, I can play with this too. And it's in. See, so I can see how far behind and far out. And then I take, if it needs to be moved, first we should take this tension off. And use the sound post setter. This is the one that was given to me by, I call my master, who taught me how to make and repair violins. He gave it to me, and I treasure this. 
I always tell everybody in the shop, if this disappears, there's going to be murder. <laughs> <laughs> this is not to be lost. You can use it, but don't lose it. To, to move a sound post, you just get in on the light and tap it. But I won't do it because there's tension on the string right now and that would damage the top. Let me say just a, can I say a thing about setups? What I do when I do a setup, what is involved in setup? Um, let me first go back and say when you buy a violin on the line or uh, you order one and it comes into the shop, 99 times out of 100, when they're shipping it, they put the sound post in tight so it won't fall down because many shops don't have someone in the shop that can set the sound post. So they just jam them in. What does that do? What it does is it keeps the top plate and the back plate from vibrating. <laughs> That's supposed to vibrate the air on the inside and, and make a note. So it's going to kill the tone. It's, I mean, it's going to play, but it's going to keep the tone from being a nice, beautiful tone. So the first thing I do on a setup is check the tightness. How tight is it? What is the location of it? So I, I get my tool out, I take the tension down, I determine where it ought to be, and that isn't precise either. You do a little adjusting on that, depending on the, on the instrument. And I tap it, and I move it around to where it should be. Tighten the strings, play it. If I don't like it, move it, and I move it around to find the best location of that. So that's part of a setup. When you bring your violin, I'm going to find out if it's in too tight. If it is too tight, often you can crack the top right where the sound post is. And that's one of the worst damage you can cause to a violin because that's where the stress is. The strings are pressing down and being resisted by the back and the sound post. If you try just putting glue in there, it's going to come loose. So what you have, the proper repair is to take it apart, take the top off, scoop out a little bowl where that sound post is, make a matching piece that will fit that precisely, mold it in, and then return the thickness to where it was originally. And it's very long, involved, and a costly repair. So on cheaper instruments, I say, throw it away. It's a wall hanging, put it up on the wall. The other things I look for in a, in a setup is um, the adjustment of the height of the bridge. This bridge is too low. I would uh, make a new bridge for this. Okay. But there's... Um, Monday. Here, <laughs> Monday. Monday. <laughs> I got Something 18... Day. Yes, I'm uh, adjusting the height of the strings above the fingerboard. That has to be very, very precise. And I make differences between what type of strings. If they're softer strings, you make the string height clearance a little higher. Steel strings, you make it a little bit lower. Uh, but this needs a new, a new bridge. And you adjust the thickness. Um, uh, then the pegs. Have the pegs become out of round? If you have the pegs, they have grain. And then when they shrink, they shrink and become oval. Because they don't shrink along the grain, they shrink across the grain. So it becomes oval. And with wear and tear and with shrinkage on your box, the peg box, those holes can become oval too. So I round up the peg and sometimes what happens is the peg is too close to the cheek to begin with so when we're rounding it up it has to touch so you make a whole new peg, make a whole new set of pegs. Um, but I try on cheaper ones if you take an oval and a circle, if one is a circle and one is a, if they're both ovals, they're going to lock when you try to turn them. If one is a circle and one is an oval, it will turn okay. So in cheaper ones, I just either ream the whole circle or adjust the peg. And I can do that by testing where the high points are and scraping it down a little bit. Um, the other thing I do is, is, uh, um, I've had a couple of cases of uh, Sarah, uh, um, a young woman who's a uh, high, school, uh, high school string teacher, brought her violin and she said, I don't like the sound of it, would you restore it and I'm going to sell it. it uh, my parents gave it to me when I was young. So I said, what's the problem? She said, it's, it's very harsh sounding. I said, I think I can take care of that. So when she left, 
I made a new bridge for her. And what I did, I, I, you buy bridges, bridges are made in blanks, um, oversized, and you uh, file the feet down to fit the top, adjust the thickness, and adjust the string height above the fingerboard, okay? So I took a whole bunch of blanks and brought them up to the front where we have a, um, a glass counter, and I dropped them. I hit bing, 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 bing. That meant that one was a little softer than the other ones. So I'm going to take this and make a bridge that is a little softer because a harder bridge is transmitting that sound to the top very quickly. But the, so the softer one is going to act sort of like a mute. It's going to quiet down that, um, that, that harshness of tone. And then I'm going to make the bridge just, it's supposed to be 4.2 millimeters thick at the bottom and 1.3 at the top. I may make it 4.3, 4.3 and a half, and maybe 1.4 at the top, which adds a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of mass, softer, and get, get a nice softer tone. She came to pick it up, she said, she played it, said, I'm never going to get rid of this one. <laughs> and I've had a couple other cases like that too. Said, I'm never going to get rid of this, but it sounds beautiful. And it's just by how the bridge was treated. Incidentally, the bridge, see, the, uh, you're familiar with bridges. That shape and that those holes have a purpose. There's an engineering, physical purpose for it. It's not haphazard. It didn't, uh, somebody didn't think, oh, that's artistic. It's there for a reason. And the reason is, if you had didn't have those holes in there and you had the bridge on top of the top and you played, the vibration would go instantly to the top and you have a very harsh sound. With these holes in there, if you look at it very closely, that string is above that hole. So the vibrations have to go around that hole and that acts as it has a dampening effect. Think about walking along concrete floor or walking along uh, a high dive board. There's a little springy there. And that's what this does. The heart at the top also isolates those strings from go carrying the sound directly to the top. It has to go out, around, and around and in. So it acts as a, uh, uh, a moderator, as a spring, so to speak, to soften the tone. All right. Okay. Oh. Um, are there any questions so far? Should have said yes. Do you ever change the size or shape of the holes in the bridge? Uh, I don't. There are some makers that believe that they can make an effect, but I, I haven't. Um, I, I have a I friend. I with the who, thickness. Yeah, I have a friend in, um, who works for a luthier in Ohio who spends a great deal of time carving out the holes to a particular shape and a particular size, depending on the size of the instrument he's working with. And uh, I think a lot of people who have the time to do that kind of work, it does make a difference on better instruments. Yeah. I should say that High Strung, although we're very proud of what we do, and, and we'll stand behind our rental fleet all the way, are, we're not dealing with very high instruments. That is not our goal. We, we work with beginners, we work with advancing players, we work with intermediates. So we don't see the very, very high-end instruments where you would take the time to carve the bridge and spend an extra hour on the curly cues. We just can't. What our goal is, is to make it as playable as possible, um, especially in thinking of the rental fleet. Uh, the first thing is playability. It's got to be comfortable. It's got to sound its best. Um, but it also has to be done within a reasonable period of time, and bear in mind that it's probably going to somebody who's eight and has never held one before. <laughs> so, um, to answer your question, I think on, on instruments where they've taken a lot of care with top and all of the rest of, of, of the building of it, it makes a difference. I think on the level of instruments that we see most often, it, it's pretty, but it doesn't necessarily have a strong effect. Um, I wanted, we've got about 20 more minutes, I think, and I do want time for people to come up. I wanted to just share with you um, some of uh, my most interesting repair, and I'm sure you can think of your most interesting at the same time. 
Uh, since I work with fretted instruments, I see a lot of different things come through the door. So most of the time I'm working on guitars and mandolins and ukuleles, but several years ago somebody brought me an instrument from the southern part of India, and I'm embarrassed that I can't remember the name of it right now. It's similar to a sitar, and it has the big gourd, and it has the frets that are probably about that long, and they're metal, and they curve over, and they're very big. And this poor thing, it was fairly old, and several of the frets were falling off. And the person who brought it to me had just recently acquired it, I don't know from where, and really didn't know anything about its construction. So it sent me on a quest to find out how these things were built. And it turned out that those frets are held in with beeswax. So I looked at it for quite a long time and finally decided I needed to clean out the old beeswax because obviously at some point, it had gotten really hot and then gotten cold rather quickly, and it was crumbling. Mm -hmm. And I had to find a source for pure be beeswax. And then I had to figure out how I was going to attach it and still make it look like the rest of the frets that were <coughs> held in, because they were all darkened with age. And as I recall, I ended up mixing the wax with like espresso ground coffee grounds <laughs> to get some of the texture, but that wouldn't really alter it and managed to mold it and get it into where it needed to be. And then I took a hair dryer and stood back. <laughs> and had to get it just melted enough, but not too much. That I, it, was like, it was like molding, it was like carving wax. I've never done anything like it. I've never done anything like that since. But it's probably the repair I will remember all my days. <laughs> and you, sir? The repair I remember all my, all my days is uh, a gentleman brought in a fine Italian cello. And uh, I looked up in the auction guide, I can't recall the, the maker right at this precise moment, uh, in the auction guide that his cello sell between twenty five and thirty thousand dollars. What had happened, and this is another major repair, the button. The neck had pulled off and the button had ripped out. That's one of the worst uh, problems you can have. Because glue, the neck is held, there's a block of wood in here, and there's a miter joint, and the neck fits into that joint. Now glue doesn't, isn't very strong in tension. So when you're pulling, the string's pulling this way, what happens, you're tilting this up, it's trying to rotate around the back end. His warehouse being a mechanical engineer, it's lifting up that way. So that glue is in tension, not very strong. So the makers, nobody's been able to prove on, improve on the make of the violin over 300 years, nobody. This little button serves the purpose of, when you're pulling up, up that wants to slide, the glue is in what we call shear, sliding. And it's very, very strong in shear, not in tension. So with the button gone, what do you do? You, you glue that back, you don't have that shear, all you have is the tension, it's going to pop out. There are several fixes, but this is a twenty-four to $30,000 cello, so I'm going to make the best repair. If I've repaired some for schools, you know, it's, it's a $200 instrument, you drill a hole, you put a dowel pin in, you color it, it looks like a little dot, it's strong. It'll do the job. It's not an expensive instrument, but this needs the proper repair. The, repar re or the proper repair was to take the back off, and in the back, I carved a groove back into here and made a slip of wood perfectly mashed that thickness that came out underneath. You follow what I said? Do you have any questions about that? And glued that back. Now it had the strength of shear, and that piece of wood went into the slot that I had carved into the back, and I took hours, it took me a month of working carefully. I didn't rush, I wanted everything to be absolutely perfect. Fit that in, but that piece was just a little bit undersized than the button. I took the button off, uh, carved out the inside, make a little cap. And I took that and glued it on the top to cover that little piece I had made. When you looked at it, 
It's the original button, except it's not functionally doing the job. It's there for the aesthetics. You look at it and you can't tell there's anything happened to it. That was a thousand dollar repair. Yeah. But it was worth it. It was a thirty thousand dollar repair. And I did one for for uh, a Duke String School also about six, seven years ago, the similar type of repair. Hmm. Okay, so we've talked a lot about repair, but not that much about the care. Um, I think, though, that probably everybody here gets that the, the best thing that can be done for instruments is making sure that the humidity is constant. And in my home, my husband plays instruments, I play instruments, we have quite a collection. So our dining room is not a dining room. <laughs> our dining room is the music room. And we got a room humidifier with a very good, uh, what is it called? I want to say hemostat, that's not it. Hygrometer. Hydro. And we aim for 40 to 45% humidity in that room at all times. In the summer, sometimes we have to put in a dehumidifier. <laughs> if you visited the shop during the summer, you probably heard our shop dehumidifier roaring um, on the on Ninth Street where we had very little control over the air conditioning or the heating. We had two dehumidifiers going and we emptied both of them twice a day. So our, our days on Broad Street are much better than that. Uh, but there are case humidifiers, there are humidifiers that go into an instrument. Uh, if, if any of you have instruments, this is the best thing that you can do for it, is just keep an eye on, is it too dry? Rarely do we see, is it too moist? Um, I think once I saw, what was it? Oh, it was a mandolin. Um, a mandolin where, I mean, you knew it was going to be trouble because the, there was mold in the case, and oh, there was okay. definitely mold in the instrument, and it really wasn't much that I wanted to do with it. Unfortunately, it was so warped and not, a, not worth it. I have a feeling that that one had been stored in a garage. Because mm -hmm. um, even in an attic, it's, it's going to be dry, it's not going to be humid. Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, to keep it safe from accidents, it should be in, it, in its case. My feeling is if an instrument is in its case, you're not going to take it out and play it. But there are safe ways to keep an instrument out. One is there are all sorts of hooks that can be put up on the wall that, you know, they're very secure. You get one of those, those what are they called? You pound them in and you put the screw through and it battles. Oh, yeah. Screw it. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Molly joints. There we go. Molly, Molly joints. Um, you can hang, you can even hang cellos. We have cellos hanging from some of those little cellos. And uh, of course, music stand, uh, instrument stands. But keep keeping your instrument out, but in a safe container is probably also one of the best things you can do. I was just talking to a customer this afternoon before we came over. Her son has started playing cello, and they realized that the cello is at much greater risk with him trying to get it into a bag and out of a bag and into a bag every time he's practicing than it would be if it were simply in a stand. So they came in and got just a simple little A-frame stand. Um, so heat, humidity, well, and they never leave it in a car. Now probably they <laughs> didn't have to worry about yeah. this. Yeah. Back in Stradivari's day or whenever day, you didn't have to worry about that, although probably you shouldn't leave it in your cart. But uh, cars we see as a real enemy of, of instruments. and. You don't see this on guitars much because their fingerboards are put on differently with the kind of epoxy that will never let go. But we have seen several instances of violins that have been brought in and the fingerboard is no longer attached to the neck in quite the, the way you would like to see it. It's now at an angle. And clearly it got left in a car on its side in very hot weather. And then it got taken out. And put in the house upright and it has now, the glue has melted, the thing has slipped, and now it has resealed itself at a very strange angle. <laughs> and, you know, we can deal with that, but we probably don't have to. So, all right, I have a glue pot going. We have bows to look at here. We have uh, instruments to look at here. We have magnets to play with. So if you have questions, by all means, please come up um, or, or if you just want to play around with the tools of the trade, you're certainly welcome to. Are there any questions before that? Yes. I have one question. You talked about manufactured instruments mm -hmm. and, and uh, 
I, I, you know, with manufacturing, you can make the tolerance exactly what you wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've seen people make the plates of the violins and they carve it out so it's just all perfect. Why can a machine not do that better than a man can and actually have a better instrument? That, that is a great question. There's differences between pieces of wood. No two pieces of wood are the same. They all have different resilience. They all have different uh, patterns in their grain patterns. So none, no two are alike. So if you took a Stradivarius violin, took it apart, measured it, and exactly duplicated it, and people have done that. I've got a book uh, on Stradivarius, all his measurements, you know, each little square inch. You duplicate that, it won't be the same thing. It just won't be the same. It has to do with the resilience of the wood, the flexibility. So it, 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 uh, you can probably come up with a pretty good quote of proximity, but you can't do it. But then the person that makes it by hand has to know that difference of wood too, then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So you compensate for that. If uh, they have found when they take the great violins apart that you what you call tap tuning. You ring a note. And they have found the best violins, the top and the back, have to be within about one note of each other, like a G and an A or an F and a G. Doesn't doesn't have to be always the same. It can be different depending on those pieces of wood. But if they're within about a note of each other, they, you end up more likely, I won't say absolutely, but more likely with a better sounding violin. If they're apart from that, then you're more likely to have a less good sounding violin. And it all has to do with each individual piece of wood. When you're tap tuning, looking for that that note, and taking a little bit more. Could you, could you explain tap tuning? Tap tuning. Okay. Can you hear that? Bum, 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 bum. There's a note. Okay. So you want the top and the back within a note. The top, um, um, you want it to be the lower. If you the top is a G, you want the back to be an A. Mm -hmm. F and G could be a E and F, as long as they're within a note of each other. So that's how you get that. And then you look for, by manually adjusting, how flexible is it? It's got to be flexible. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Arlene. I have a question about um, new materials. So I know this is not a talk about making, but in repairing, have you found that the use of new materials has helped or hindered or changed the repair process? I'm thinking of particle board, yeah. not new, but also fiber, various things that are coming in, especially with bows, and I've seen carbon fiber back to cellos, and mm -hmm. I was wondering how that affects your job. That's actually a really good question, uh, and I have question. meant to touch on that, because um, in my world, in the world of the fretted instruments, um, you s we've seen a specific change from about the 1780s on. Uh, nuts, for, for example, on a guitar were something like they are now on violins, they were ebony. And at some point, they switched to bone, because on a guitar, it gives you, you wouldn't think it, it's such a small piece, but it does give you a greater resonance. So it's usually cow bone, um, something easily obtainable, something easy to work with. And then probably in about the 50s, when plastics came to be the rage, cheaper guitars, you started seeing these nuts and saddles being made with plastics. And in fact, I was having a discussion with somebody this afternoon about the pros and cons of converting or making a new saddle specifically, not to, but probably saddle for his guitar. He's got a nice guitar, but it's got one of these cheap plastic saddles, and strings are cutting through it. Um, so yes, probably a harder material. And ivory, I'm sure, was used at one point, but of course it's a protected material now. What I have had a few calls about is whether or not somebody should invest in fossilized walrus tusk for their bridge pins. <laughs> and I personally have to draw the line. I don't, I don't believe that your bridge pins, which are what hold the strings for a guitar, make a tonal difference. I do think that the saddle does and the nut does, but your sound stops when it is entering at the bridge pin. It shouldn't really be having an effect. Um, 
However, so there's a material out there that we use that's called Tusk, T-U-S-K. And it is a synthetic, but it, it's stronger than bone, so it doesn't wear down. And it has the same resonance as some of these fossilized walrus tusks or the ivory used to have. So in, in my world, there are some things that have come into being that are making it easier to work. Um, things last longer, they give you better tone for a very small investment. Uh, carbon fiber, we've had one carbon fiber guitar in the shop that was on consignment and none of us quite trusted it when it first came through the door. Uh, it was gray and looked a little strange. It looked like something Darth Vader should have been <laughs> wearing, but the tone was incredible. And I have no idea what the people who built it did to make it so incredible. It was extremely light because you didn't have the bracing issue they do with the tops and the backs of guitar guitars. And it just sang. It sold like that. Um, we're seeing carbon fiber, especially with bows. Bones. And uh, those have come into their own in the last 10 to 15 years. They've been on the market for at least 20. And when they started, you know, they, they were very pricey, but they weren't really tested yet, and nobody quite trusted them. And Codabo, I think, is the company that really has taken off with them, but it has had many imitators. And there are certainly cheap carbon fiber bows out there. We had a batch of those in last year, and they all, well, they, they didn't all, but probably 15% of them split right there, mm -hmm. which is not what you, I, you can see that happening with wood. That's a very weak spot, and it's wood, and it's grain, carbon fiber should not have split mm -hmm. there. Um, so there are the pros and cons. Um, yeah, I have an opinion on that, um, being an engineer. <laughs> um, they've made violins from various materials, and usually it never duplicates the original, which is um, a maple, curly maple backs, maple sides, maple necks, ebony on all the back black parts, and spruce on the top. And that's been used and used and many, many times. But recently I saw the, Ameri the Violent Society of America, some builders made them out of balsa, balsa wood. Oh, no. And they said the tone was incredible. It's beautiful because it's flexible. Yeah. Now the problem with, with violins, making violins, is you're trying to balance two things. It's, you've got about 60 pounds pulling on it, so you need strength. But you need lightness, too. So if you made a, a violin really, really, really strong, it, it won't sound good. If you make it really, really light, it may sound good. In fact, a lot of violin makers do that. They make their tops very thin to get a lot of tone production, but they're weak, and they crack, and they don't hold up. So it's trying to balance those two things, strength, versus lightness for tone, strength so that it will last a long time. The balsa ones, they sound great. Three months later, <laughs> they're, they're gone. But they sound good for a while. So the genius in making the violin was getting it the perfect balance between strength and lightness to get the beautiful beauty of the tone. So I believe that uh, eventually, they are going to make composites that will duplicate the properties of wood. I really believe that. Uh, the wood, a piece of spruce, you have the winter grains, which are the little uh, dark lines, and the summer grain, which is pulpy. So that's soft and hard. Why can't we just duplicate that and make uh, a composite that has grains just like wood, with the same exact properties. I believe, I really do, that eventually they will make composites that will duplicate wood and then, then you can be more certain how it's going to come out each and every time because it will be the same all the time. I believe that, but it may be 300 years from now. I don't know when that's going to happen. But that's just my belief, my opinion. Yes? I have a, uh, you talked about the guitar that is in a domestic area. So it is household. <laughs> As the wood changes and ages and absorbs energies, you talked about setting up. Is there some prescribed maintenance schedule that 
I should be following uh, as far as having it adjusted or yes. checked or verified? Yes, and it's seasonal. Um, in this part of the country, I like to look at guitars twice a year. I like to look at them in the spring and then again in the fall. Uh, when you get the, the most dramatic shifts in the weather, you know, suddenly the days are both hot and cold, and they're both dry and humid, and that's when you start to see changes. And it's true on the bowed strings as well. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I played cello as a child. And in Wisconsin, you have extremes of temperature, and so on a cello in Wisconsin, you have a winter bridge and a summer bridge. I no longer play, so I don't know if that's true here where you have to have one that's very tall and one that's not. Some people use that. I never did. I, I had to because, you know, the strings were like this. To a lesser extent, you see that with the guitar. So that in um, spring, very often the strings feel a little slack under your fingers. Your instrument sounds a little bit dead. Um, the things that I look for when I'm doing a setup is the first thing I do is get the strings. Well, the first thing I do is take measurements. I want to know where the string height is when you got it tuned up, I'm going to know what strength of strings you've got on there. Uh, so there's several different things that I'm looking at and measuring and writing down. I check the bracing of the guitar, because on guitars, um, when they dry out, the bracing, very often, you can feel how dry it is. You can get your hand inside your guitar, uh, and you can feel the glue starting to give around the edges. And sometimes they just plain split. I had somebody bring me a guitar last week. Um, he said he'd taken it to somebody else, they'd spent hours, they couldn't figure out what it was, it was still buzzing, and I got in there with lights and mirrors and it took me 30 minutes and I finally found a hairline crack in one brace. And I watched when I strung the, the bass string, which is what was doing it, and sure enough it was just vibrating that much. So, preventive maintenance. He, I get in there, I check, how secure are they? It doesn't feel like it's splitting. Um, are your frets starting to rise up because the wood has shrunk away? If you ever have prickly feelings, uh, we call that fret to sprout. And uh, just keeping your, your fingerboard humidified, there's, there's either good old lemon oil, which is fine in moderation, or certain oils and, and humectants that are made specifically for fingerboards that help keep those frets where they're supposed to be. Uh, so there's, and then your truss rod, assuming your guitar has a truss rod, is the key to keeping it really happy. You don't need it too tight, you don't need it too loose. There has to be just the right amount of scoop. I'll be using Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? I think we're just about out of time. Okay, well, um, good. But if, if I think that, that we've got, um, they've got such amazing things up on these tables. If you don't mind holding off going out for the receptions for a few minutes so you can answer individual questions sure. and you can actually come and see things yeah. a little bit more um, closely. Um, I just want to touch on thank you, um, Bud and Lee, for coming in and giving such an interesting talk today. Um, I've learned a lot and it's been, it's, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very much.